Welcome back for the second of our lectures on opioids. We're going to talk about a couple of different time periods in U.S. history and how they relate to opioid regulation and abuse. Uh, and we'll start with opioid abuse before the Harrison Act, so before that major piece of national level legislation in 1914. Um, so before the Harrison Act, we saw three different kinds of opioid use and dependence, basically. Um, we had those uh, patent medicines. Remember, these are the ones that you can make in your backyard, no real regulation about them. They can contain just about anything you want, uh, and you can sell them uh, to describing any kind of benefit that you like. Uh, the reality is that a lot of these include uh, opium. Uh, we also saw smoking of opium. Uh, this was primarily by Chinese laborers. Uh, how this might look is kind of depicted in that uh, picture on the right hand corner of the slide there. And then injection of morphine, so the more refined form that was in injected directly into the body. Um, so those were the three main categories with injectable morphine being the most dangerous form of use. Uh, and if we look at how much the population was dependent, so this isn't use, this is dependence, uh, the peak of this was really at the beginning of the 20th, 20th century, uh, and it could have been as high as 1% of the population. So fairly widespread, definitely the highest rates of opioid use uh, that, we that we've reported. Um, so at this time, opioid dependence wasn't really seen as a major social problem. Um, the smoking of opioids uh, was a bit frowned upon, but that was mostly because of the ethnic groups that it was associated with, those uh, immigrant laborers. Uh, the opium consumption in patent medicines, very acceptable socially. Uh, and the fact that it might lead to dependence was just kind of a, you know, a, kind of an inevitable effect. Uh, people were seen with a lot of sympathy uh, if they ended up there, uh, possibly because of the typical person that this happened to. So our typical user at this time was a 30 to 50 year old uh, middle class white woman who actually purchased the drugs legally through patent medication. So, um, we didn't really see this. Again, think of this maybe as the alcohol of the time, uh, the perceptions of alcohol. Uh, there are people who have who are clearly dependent on alcohol and it can cause problems, but it doesn't mean for most of us that we would consider uh, banning the sale of alcohol or the use of alcohol in other populations. So uh, this perception that just because some people had a problem with it um, didn't mean that everyone had to be banned from using it. So then in 1914, uh, we see the Harrison Act passed. And remember, this is where the federal government really is asserting its right to tax sales of these sorts of substances. Uh, so when the Harrison Act became to be enforced, uh, it made it more difficult to obtain opioids and really the only sources of drugs uh, that, were, um, that were common were illegal dealers. So the, the result of the Harrison Act was that opioid use patterns changed. Oral use, uh, so the through those patent medications declined. Uh, and that the primary, uh, maybe moved to alcohol actually, uh, and that what was left was a group of users who either injected morphine or heroin. Um, this increased both the cost and the risk of use, a lot more danger in consuming these methods. They were more potent and more toxic. Um, and as both the cost and the risk of use increased, uh, we saw people tend to favor the most potent methods, so the most bang for the buck. Uh, and again, we saw this change that people who were dependent on opioids uh, were now criminals rather than victims. So um, we saw another change uh, after World War II, uh, where we saw the use of heroin increase in uh, low-income areas of large cities. Uh, and then um, in the 60s and 70s, uh, another continuing increase, still not as high as the beginning of the 20th century, uh, but again, this use was associated with minority populations. Uh, in New York at the time, we get the Rockefeller drug laws, which were the strictest drug laws in the United States. Um, but we also saw um, a, a trend in heroin use, again associated with um, with military service. Uh, this was with soldiers who were uh, deployed in Vietnam. So heroin in Vietnam was relatively cheap, it was relatively pure, and it was relatively easy to get. Uh, a random sample of uh, uh, personnel in, uh, military personnel in Vietnam, about 5% of them tested positive for opioids. Uh, and it was not injected so much um, as smoked or sniffed uh, because that was what was common in the setting. Um, but uh, we did see that most users stopped when they returned to the United States. This could have been because of difficulty obtaining it um, or changes in uh, social pressure. But either way, most of the folks who you, most of the personnel who used uh, heroin in Vietnam, when they returned home, they stopped that usage. So what we learned from that is that if the if the conditions are correct, so under certain specific conditions, a relatively high percentage of people will use opioids recreationally. Remember, our highest report rate before this point was about 1% in our population. 
Um, and then also some really interesting observations about opioid dependence. Um, people were able to start in a certain setting and then stop when they return to their more typical setting. So um, some interesting patterns there related with use in uh, heroin, or I'm sorry, use of heroin in Vietnam related to the Vietnam War. Um, so moving on to um, production of heroin, uh, most of the heroin that's used in the United States is derived from poppies that are actually grown in either in Mexico or Colombia. Uh, and we've seen some manufacturing changes over the past couple of decades. Uh, in the 70s, the purity of the heroin available in the United States was about 5%, uh, moving up through the 80s to the current time, about 40 to 60% purity. Um, so a really, a really pretty, pretty dramatic increase um, in the purity, but we still have a rel very small uh, fraction of Americans who use heroin. This is not a really common drug of use or abuse in the United States. About 0.2% report, report past year use of any kind of heroin here in the U.S. Now, when we do talk about the abuse of opioids here in the U.S. in the 21st century, often what we're talking about really is the uh, abuse of prescription opioids. Um, we've heard lots of different names for these. You may have heard of, of Vicodin. You might have gotten a prescription for lower tabs after maybe um, having your wisdom teeth removed. Um, Oxy, Percocet. Um, these are, there's lots of different trade names, but these both fall under, uh, all of these fall under these two major groups, either hydrocodone or oxycodone. Um, and they're different formulations of prescription opioids commonly prescribed for pain control. Uh, when we look at the prevalence of use, uh, this is definitely an issue that gets a lot of attention from the news. Uh, and some of it is definitely warranted. Um, we've seen an increase in use uh, over the past decade or so. Uh, and a definite increase in abuse. Uh, starting in, uh, if we look at data from 2015, uh, we saw that 1.4% of Americans aged 12 and up reported non-medical use in the past month. So um, about 1.5% of the population uh, has used some kind of prescription opioid um, for non-medical use, right? So this is pretty concerning. And then on, in 2017, we actually, a um, slightly different survey asking about you at least once in the past year, actually saw 18 million Americans report they had used uh, prescription opioids uh, for non-medical purposes at least once in the past year. Uh, so this is definitely something that we hear a lot about uh, in terms of news coverage, um, and it is uh, it is a cause for concern. When we talk about how these uh, opioids are actually cons consumed, um, here we're usually talking about um, either oral consumption, so taking a pill uh, in the traditional way that you take it if you, this, these had actually been uh, prescribed for you, and then also insufflation and injection. Um, and beyond the um, the concerns that we have with any drug of abuse, um, there are some special safety concerns for opioids uh, because they are depressants, right? So they they depress the um, central nervous system and respiration. Um, there are some serious concerns here in terms of uh, survivability of an overdose. In terms of DAWN data, that emergency room data, prescription opioids currently rank third for ER visits and first for deaths. Although it's really important to note that this typically is not opioids on their own. This isn't sole opioid use, but it's actually typically in combination with other sedatives such as alcohol. And really this is the most typical uh, scenario we see, for, we see for those ER visits and, and for those deaths. It's uh, opioid overdoses in combination with uh, with other drugs, primarily alcohol. Um, so when you do hear that news coverage, keep in mind um, that it's not necessarily the opioids themselves, uh, but this opioids in combination that really is the larger safety concern. Uh, if we look at how the uh, different um, opioid chemicals are constituted, uh, you can see some real similarities there in the chemical structure, uh, both morphine, codeine, and heroin. Uh, remember, they're all derived from opium, which is what would give them their common uh, chemical characteristics. So when we talk about prescription opioids, uh, basically we're talking about prescription pain relievers or analgesics that are narcotics. Uh, we've got the natural products, morphine and codeine, that are derived directly from the poppy plant. Uh, and then we've got the uh, heroin, which is based on the uh, poppy plant, but chemically altered. And then we've got the ones that are completely synthetic, the ones that are lab created. And this is where we find oxycodone, hydrocodone, fentanyl, drugs like that. So classified here by their, um, their, their source, whether it's natural, semi-synthetic, or synthetic created in a lab. So this will wrap up our second lecture on opioids, and we'll be back to talk about the mechanism of action.